Very good afternoon to all the parents, mummies, daddies, and children who are already here. Uh, if you know of anyone else who is interested and in, in the area and want to come and join us up here, uh, please help to uh, spread the word. Let them know that it's at this space because uh, I do believe that this space is very, very nice, but it's not the easiest place to, to spot or find. <laughs> okay, so but thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Pei Fen, and I'll be your MC for this afternoon. And uh, we are going to be learning from three experts very shortly, but uh, maybe a little introduction, uh, self-introduction. I'm a mother of two. I am working in the media as a radio DJ. And um, so for me, uh, balancing work and motherhood has always been a struggle. I would say sometimes I survive, sometimes I do a little bit better than survive, but I'm not thriving yet. So we're all here to learn. And I'm sure uh, all of us have successes and defeats on this journey called parenthood. And we're here to support each other as well. So we're very excited to have you here. And I'm sure you'll benefit greatly from the program because it's not just this talk. Uh, we have many other fringe activities. We also have other panel discussions. Uh, we have another one later on and also tomorrow at One Pongo. PCF Parenting Conference 2023 is part of Singapore Parenting Festival by Media Corp and the Asian Parent. Besides the panel discussions, there are numerous parent and child workshops, which I believe maybe some of you already took part in, art and craft and storytelling activities for children at the various venues today at our Tampanese Hub, and like I said, tomorrow at Wan Pongo. So do get your friends and families to join us today and tomorrow to have a fun-filled weekend. All right, this afternoon, we have invited three distinguished speakers to reveal the truths about early childhood to us. Please join me in welcoming them, all right? First up, we have Mr. Parkson Lok, Family Life Educator and Coach Center for Fathering. Parkson, could you just take a little seat over here first? And I'll invite the other two ladies up as well. And next up, we have Dr. Chia. Dr. Moira Chia, <laughs> consultant, KKH Women's and Children's Hospital. Hello, thank you so much. Uh, it's okay. Oh, we are, okay, Parkson is uh, being a gentleman. Okay, actually, I think, yeah. <laughs> All right, and last but definitely not least, Miss Kelly Tay, founder of Juicy Parenting. All right, we can all now make ourselves comfortable and take a seat. Let's get to know our speakers a little bit more before they start on their presentation. Uh, hi, Parkson. <laughs> Hello. Uh, I know you're here to share about fatherhood, fathering. Uh, yes, a little. <laughs> but maybe um, we can know a little bit more about, you know, what you do other than share about fatherhood. <laughs> well, I have been a father for 31 years, so that's the age of my oldest child, and my youngest is 18, so I have wow. three in all, uh, and two grandkids, two over two years old, and one who is coming to one year old. Wow. Yeah. So I work with a non-profit organization called Center for Fathering. If you have not heard of it, we are the ones that champion and drive the movement called Dads for Life. Maybe you have heard of that. Yeah. So in that organization, I'm basically in charge of uh, programs, workshops. I deliver the workshops and do even one-to-one -one coaching. Um, yeah. So that's what I do. Thank and you. also, yeah, producing videos. Wow. Okay. A lot of experience, a lot of stories, I'm sure. And we'll learn more about those later. Okay. And our next guest, Dr. Moira, of course, um, you are the expert at tummy time because that's what she's going to be sharing with us later. But of course, um, what about your experiences as consultant at KKH? Could you share a little bit more? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much, Payfen, for that kind introduction. <laughs> so, hi. Uh, good afternoon to all. Uh, I'm Dr. Chia from KK, and uh, I'm very happy to uh, speak to everyone today. So, I'm a consultant at KK. I've been a consultant for five years, and I have uh, three children who are right there. And they have uh, taken it upon themselves to check my slides for grammatical errors. <laughs> Very good. Uh, yeah, um, in my day-to-day, -day, I do meet a lot of parents and I see children as well. And a lot of parents, uh, I do have 
an enjoyable time chatting with uh, parents on how to help keep their child healthy. And this is something that's very important for me. Yeah. Mm, okay, very important indeed. All right, and next uh, we have Kelly. Kelly, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how or why. I mean, how sounds like a long, <laughs> a lot of things to say, but how about why uh, you set up Juicy Parenting? Yeah, thank you. So my name is Kelly. I'm the founder of a business called Juicy Parenting, and I do parent coaching specifically focused on Asian families. And why I set it up was honestly, when I became a mom, I realized I don't know the next thing about being an excellent parent, right? No one goes to parenting school. And so I did a ton of research. I did a lot of professional level causes. And all it taught me was, wow, we have so much to learn if we want to raise kids well. And actually, I didn't think I was going to start this business. People started asking me to teach. And so that's when I ended up starting my business and starting my online course. Because honestly, I believe that we all deserve to enjoy our kids. We deserve to enjoy the parenting journey. And our kids deserve great parents, yeah. not just parents who are you know, just doing whatever has been done for generations. That's really true. I think uh, society on the whole and the environment that we parent in now is so different from the time that we were kids. So there's so much to learn, so much to know. But a lot of times for me, the more I know, the more I feel I don't know. So <laughs> I get really lost. And then sometimes I would just, you know, do whatever it is that comes to me uh, naturally. But sometimes the natural reaction might not be the best for our kids. So I think it's very important to equip ourselves with a lot of strategies and a lot of uh, tips and tricks. So that's what we're here for uh, at the parenting conference today. And of course, in the journey of parenthood, well, um, parenthood nowadays is so much more uh, than just procreation and survival. It's so much more. And fatherhood is so much more than just bread winning, right? So we will now move on to our first presentation for Parkson to share with us why fathers should read to and play with your kids. Thank you. Thank give you. him a round of applause. Payphon, you're right that fathers need to, nowadays need to do more than just bringing the bread home. They need to put butter and peanut butter on it. <laughs> and jam, organic and jam. jam. Yes, yeah. if you prefer jam, that would be great too. Okay. Now, thank you, thank you. Um, if you look at this picture, all right, and imagine that this boy is your child, your son, and you are the parent, what would you be saying to this boy? Okay, any answers? You can just shout out from where you are, fathers especially. Fathers and mothers. Oh, mothers also? Yes. Okay. I think mothers. Then, then we'll see the difference between your answers. Oh, someone say have fun. I think for me it's ah! Okay, but anyway, so fathers or mothers? <laughs> what would you be saying if that's your child? No. This okay. mom, mom says no. Mom Somebody says, says no. we. You right. say we. <laughs> we. All right, that's good. Okay. Yeah. So the typical responses or reactions of parents are either, wow, it's dirty. All right. It's dangerous. Who knows what's in, like, in, in there, right? Maybe a nail, maybe a scorpion, maybe a snake. Okay, all right. So that, that's uh, very typical, okay? But if you ask this child, what are you doing? What were you thinking? The child would say, nothing. And that is the definition of play, actually. Okay, the definition of play is that they do something that is actually for no specific purpose, except for pure enjoyment. All right? Okay? So, and the, another definition of play is to engage in activity for enjoyment and recreation rather than any serious or practical purpose. But our culture, for example, the Asian culture or even specifically in Singapore, we have devalued play. Okay? And taking, for example, this from the three, class, three character classics, which is a Chinese classic from long time ago, it says that diligence yields reward. It means when you're hardworking, you will get rewarded in life. But when you play, it takes you nowhere. All right? And therefore, as parents, I'm sure you've heard yourself say or you heard other parents say, you know, stop playing. <laughs> All right? Go back and study, you know, stop playing, you know. So play has become something that we do it when we have some time, extra time. After you have done all that you need to do, then you can think about playing, 
All right? And that's what my father said to me, you know, work hard, study hard, get a good job, you know, and when you retire, you can do anything you want. I said, I want to play now, <laughs> not, not 40 years from now, okay? Fred Rogers, a very famous guy in America, he's known as Mr. Mr. Rogers in, uh, in America. He says, play is often talked about as if it were a relief from serious work, okay? But for children, play is serious learning. So I'm sure you heard of the term learning through play, isn't it? Okay, now my peeve with that is that we focus more on the learning than the play. <laughs> All right, learning happens through play naturally. But somehow we feel very uncomfortable by not having any KPIs or benchmarks or anything like that. We must have KPIs. You know, after playing, after spending an hour of play, we ask the kids, okay, what have you learned? I think that takes the fun out of play, isn't it? All right, okay. Yeah, so play is an essential aspect of early childhood. Now, if you ask me when does early childhood end, I would say 10. <laughs> All right, so play should continue. And for adults, especially dads, play. All right, we need to play too. Now, what's the opposite of play? A lot of people will say work. But according to this psychologist, he believes that the opposite of play is actually Depression. Wow. Sounds serious, okay? I'm sure he has reasons for that, but I think I can see why, all right? Now, now I'm going to focus on dads. Now, dads, we have a very special role in our children's lives, all right? We can be nurturing, we can be very warm and all that, but we have a superpower, and that superpower is play, all right? And we play in a very, very different way compared to mothers. It's something called rough and tumble, okay? So as you can see, these two boys here, they're, that's what they're doing, rough and tumble kind of play. We wrestle, we roll around, we push each other, right? Okay? Now, to mothers, this would seem dangerous, right? Dad, you are so big and your boy is so small. You might break his bone, isn't it? I mean, we can think of a thousand and one reasons. But this is very, very essential, because even animals in the wild do that. It is part of their training for survival, all right? And yeah, basically to be able to know what to do, all right? It's the training for their instincts, it's training for them to know uh, what to, how to react in different kinds of situations. Rub and tumble play is important for all these reasons. Kids learn healthy risk-taking. Okay, because in rough and tumble play, you need to get to know how much strength you have and how much to use so that nobody gets hurt, whether it's the other person or yourself. Okay, so you learn how to control your strength and know what you're capable of doing. It also develops physical bond because in rough and tumble play, there's a lot of skin-to-skin -skin contact. When your child is an infant, right, the bonding that, that happens takes place through mainly skin-to-skin -skin contact. As you're holding your child, cuddling your child, changing diapers with your child, bathing your child, all those involve skin-to-skin -skin contact and that's where the bonding takes place. But when your child is no longer an infant, how do you continue that skin-to-skin -skin contact? Well, one of the ways is through rough and tumble play. Okay? Uh, your child also learns, the child also learns social competence, okay? How to be considerate of the other person because sometimes when you get carried away in, in play, you forget what that person is able to tolerate, what the person likes and this doesn't like. It exercises the mind and body and it's finally and most importantly, just pure fun. Now, I've been asked, should fathers play rough and tumble not only with their sons but how about their daughters? What do you think? Is, is yes? How many says yes? How many say no? All right, it seems like everyone agrees. Yes, okay. All right, it's a, totally appropriate to do that also. Okay, so for dads, this is a research that found that fathers play in the early years can positively contribute to children's social, emotional, and cognitive outcomes. All right, so they're 
so many benefits of play alone, especially when fathers play. When my, when my youngest daughter was in P4 and she chose um, volleyball as a CCA. Now, I'm a sports fan. Any Liverpool fans here? Sorry, man, you. <laughs> Any all Liverpool right. fans? <laughs> oh, there, we have a few. Okay, all right. So anyway, you know, I said, I, I don't play volleyball. I mean, I, I don't mind watching it, but I don't play it, you know. Uh, but one day while I was at work, my wife texted me and said, and asked, are you coming home at the same time? I said, yes. Why? Your daughter is waiting for you. Waiting for me? For what? To play volleyball. <laughs> I said, but you are the athletic one, you know, you, you are the one who is sporty and all that, all right? She's, and then she replied, well, your daughter wants to play with you. Okay, so that's, that's why I say this is our superpower. Our children somehow, generally speaking, most of the time, prefers to play with their dads, okay? Because when they play with their dads, they know there are less rules. Yes. <laughs> okay, all right. Okay, so uh, people whose fathers played with them more as they were growing up developed stronger self-control as they become adolescents. You know, rough and tumble kind of play, you know, risk-taking, you know, very exuberant play. What it does to the child, it, it raises their heart rate, right? It makes them very excited, you know, full of energy, adrenaline flowing. And then there comes a time where the father will say, okay, all right, time to cool down, time to calm down. And then we've got to go home and take a shower and get ready for dinner. So the whole process, the whole routine of, you know, re hitting the highs and then after having to calm down, all right, is a very important thing to experience and learn in order to develop self-control or, or emotional regulation. Okay, all right. So all, all these little things, add up to help the child develop in the best holistic way. All right, now let's come to reading. Okay, now I, I can't turn around and read everything to you, so I'll just gen, uh, summarize it for you. Fathers and mothers read to their children. I hope you are doing that, okay? There was this uh, article the, just the other day, maybe yesterday or two days ago, that you know, at P4, P4 students in Singapore don't enjoy reading. That's really sad, you know? Okay, so I hope if you really want to raise a lifelong reader, there are three things you can do. Number one, surround your child with books. Now, I, I'm a reader, okay? I used to read more than I do today. So I have lots of books at home, and my children would pick them up and start reading them, you know? Even though they can't, they just pick them up and start reading, and then eventually they will just, you know, read all by themselves. So surround your child with books. Number two, all right, read to them or read with them, depending on their age. Read, okay? Read to them, read with them. And then thirdly, model to them. Be a reader yourself. Let your children see that you're always with a book, except when you're driving, <laughs> okay? All right? If you're an MRT, instead of looking to your phones, read a book. All right? Show them that a book is such a versatile thing, it's such a convenient thing, you can bring it all along, and any spare time you have, you are just going into this different world, all right, and learning new things and having different experiences. Now, fathers and mothers read differently to their kids. Just like in play, right? You know, fathers tend to be more exuberant, more risk-taking and all that. Fathers will say to their kids, try this, you know, uh, test this. Explore, experiment. Same thing with reading. Studies have found, generally speaking, mothers, when it comes to reading, they tend to stick with the text. And then when it comes to interacting with their children, they tend to, you know, it's like primary three comprehension. <laughs> All right? Who is this? Who is this? What's this? What did he do? What did she do? What happened? You know? All right? Uh, but for fathers... I'm one of them, you know. You read a story and then you get bored, meaning the father, all right? You get bored with the story and so you create your own story. You go to the moon, you go to Mars, you go to Jupiter, all the way to Pluto and then you come back to Earth. Now, it might, it might seem to some people, hey, that's not reading. 
You know, you're, you're teaching the child the wrong thing. you right. The child should read from page one to the last page. Well, don't take it too seriously, okay? This is supposed to be fun. The learning doesn't come from the reading itself. That's what studies find. The learning comes through the interaction, all right? After reading a few pages, when you just reflect on the story, and, you know, like for example, if you're reading Mary Had a Little Lamb, you can ask the child, do you have a friend named Mary? Okay, so you're connecting what the child is reading or what you are reading to the child about with some experiences the child might have had. Okay, sheep. Well, sheep have fleas. What do we have? Do we have fleas? Hope not. <laughs> we have hair, you know. Okay, and so you compare things like that and the child learns through these interactions more than just reading the book itself. All right, that's why studies find, experts tell us that, you know, it's important that parents or adults read to or with the child rather than just give the child maybe an e-book, okay, or an animated video to watch because most likely they will not learn anything. Okay, so let me just skip through all this. And the last thing I want to say to you is this. Oops. Oops, too far. <laughs> I wanted to go back. <laughs> can you oh, go back to that one? I think he can. Uh, just after this. This is before. After, um, yeah. One more, right? And then... Yes. Okay. All right. I find this very, very... Nice rhyme. Powerful, <laughs> yes. There is no app to replace your lap. Okay, parents? There's no app to replace your lap. Just let your child sit on your lap, read together, enjoy the story together, talk about the story, relate it with your experiences, okay? And... Yeah, read to your child. It doesn't okay. even have to be like an hour, right? No, I mean, 15 no. minutes. Yes, is that's a, kind of the enough. magic number. Just 15 minutes, okay, a day or each time a day. You can do it as often as you want during the day, okay? This has much, much power. Uh, join me in this Telegram chat group if you'd like to learn more, okay? And, uh, so we yes. scan the code? Uh, yeah, if you want to. Oh, if you want to. Uh, I think some... <laughs> Okay, would, would yeah, you like you can to? Come okay. and, yeah, come to me later. <laughs> okay, let's give Parkson a round of applause. I think it was uh, nice and uh, insightful yet friendly <laughs> presentation for all fathers out there. And yeah, uh, hopefully you get some inspiration, okay? All right, uh, PCF values respect for diversity and inclusivity. So this includes recognizing and respecting the important role that fathers play in a child's life. So we are really grateful for all the dads here today, okay? Um, okay, so next we have our second presentation. And remember, if you have any questions to ask any of our experts, uh, you can note them down, maybe uh, either type it in your uh, phone or keep it in your brain, but mommy brain, so maybe type it in your phone if, you, if you're afraid that you'll forget. So uh, at the end of the three presentation, we have a Q&A session where you can uh, voice your queries or maybe even just share something with us, okay? All right, so the second presentation is going to be by Dr. Moira. And she is, of course, uh, her fan club is really excited right now. Dr. Moira. <laughs> hey. <laughs> her family is here. Her daughters are here. Thank Three, you. right? Three of them. Fun, yes. Okay, so Dr. Moira is going to be sharing with us. Tell me time for my child. Why, when, and how? Take it away. Thank you. Thank you, Payfun. And... Thanks, Parkson, for sharing on that uh, really, really insightful bits on reading and play. And actually, I, I must say that I do remember my parents reading to me quite a lot. And so I try to do that for my children, but sometimes I fall asleep. Okay, but that's a separate <laughs> topic. <laughs> okay, so thanks everyone for uh, tuning in. Today, I'm just going to be talking about tummy time for our children. And um, thinking about tummy time, I think a lot of us... Uh, might approach it a little bit cautiously. So I, I'm just here to um, explain and share on how we can all think about tummy time when we play with our child especially. Clicker. Yes. Clicker? 
Tummy time. Yeah. I, I have forgotten about tummy time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is tummy time? Tummy time happens when um, our child is lying on the tummy uh, with the weight on the forearms. And this can occur at any time of the day in ch children of any age. So why is tummy time important for children? It's especially important for their physical development. Uh, during tummy time, they are actually uh, exercising the muscles of the back and the neck. And that's when it strengthens their neck and back muscles. And during that time, they are also learning about how their body works and moves. So for example, um, they might realize that if they use a certain muscle, their head kind of moves up uh, in a certain way. Or if they use another group of muscles, their head will turn. So in that way, they're actually learning uh, a lot about their body. And lastly, it uh, develops their skills uh, to develop skills like sitting, rolling, and that's all very important for their development. So not just physical uh, development, it also helps with our mental stimulation. So if you think about what happens during tummy time, they might, uh, uh, they might meet with certain changes in the environment. Like let's say there's a sound on the right side, they might then turn their head and respond to that sound. So that's how they learn to respond to changes. Or they might see their pet coming you know, towards them and they might want to crawl towards their pet. So again, that's responding to change. And in doing tummy time, they're actually able to observe their environment uh, much better than if they were lying down on the mat and just looking at the ceiling. So, you know, they are able to look around them, observe uh, what's happening around them, see what mommy and daddy are doing, um, looking at outside the window. Yeah, so they actually get a lot of visual stimulation when they are doing tummy time. And certainly, it, learn, uh, it helps them to learn regulation. So... For example, you know, if they are on their tummy, they start to feel a bit tired, they might cry a little bit or call for help. And then if let's say, you know, mommy and daddy are nearby, we might encourage them to say, you know, try for a little while longer. And they might then learn to, okay, I will, you know, try persevere a little longer. And that's when they actually learn how to persevere and they also learn patience. And what uh, is going to be taught at the next talk. Okay, so the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics recommends a back-to-sleep approach. So meaning that when children are put to sleep, uh, we do put them on their backs to reduce the risk of sudden infant death syndrome. And with that, we actually have found a lot of uh, babies do develop a bit of a flat spot on their head, uh, especially in the area whereby they prefer to sleep on. And doing uh, more tummy time actually helps with that a lot. And we have found that because the back and the neck muscles are strengthened during that process, when they're sleeping, they're much more able to move their head and their neck around, and it reduces the risk of the flat spot happening. And here we do see that the WHO, which is the World Health Organization, recommends about 30 minutes of tummy time a day, especially in children who are not ambulant, meaning that they have not learned to crawl or walk. So 30 minutes in a day, of course, not all at a go. That'll be uh, like BMT. Eh? So just a few minutes each time and then uh, spread across the day. That would be most sufficient for them. And this is in children less than one year old. Okay, so now we know why uh, and what's the benefit of tummy time. You just touch on how to do it. And this is where, I mean, I myself have found great difficulty uh, in starting it, especially when it came to my first child. This is her at two months suffering. <laughs> she's, doing, <laughs> she's doing tummy time on my lap and this is the first time she, uh, you know, I, I had her do tummy time and she was about two months old here and I was very scared and I was thinking, okay, she's going to be suffocated. So I, I had to take a picture to show that, you know, she was fine. <laughs> Yeah, so she, this is her at two months. And I remember it was very, very challenging for me because, you know, as much as I handle babies at work, it's different when it's a child. And just flipping her over to her front, you know, was a great challenge for me and I was very, very worried. So let's talk about more how to, how to overcome that fear. Huh? Okay, so here, you know, I've just made up like a little mnemonic. 
Principles of tummy time, fast principles. So we want a firm and flat surface. We, we would like the child to be awake. Supervise the child and ideally we should do the tummy time with the child together. Okay, so a little bit more on the surface that we would uh, recommend. On the left here, you can see, you know, those mats with the water inside that's like very like, whoa, you know. That's quite wobbly for the child who's just starting off. I think if the child is a little bit older, like say eight months or so, you know, a bit more comfortable and strong, stronger in the neck, that's fine. But uh, if the child is just starting off, it might be a little bit too wobbly and they might lose balance and that can cause them to be quite distressed and they might not like that. Um, the bed, okay, some beds are quite firm, that's fine. But if it's too soft, you know, the blanket and the quilt's too soft, they might become a bit smothered. Lah. So the, the, the nose and the face might get uh, suffocated. So this one here, the firm mat, that's just right. So that will allow the child to have a bit of an anchoring point and can balance much better uh, with that. Okay, so now we come to awake. Huh? Uh, on the left here, the child is sleeping. And again, we do recommend child to sleep on their backs so that the airway can become clear and it does not get blocked. So when a child is sleeping on the front, it's not getting the most benefit out of tummy time because they're not using their neck and their back muscles. And in fact, the airway can become blocked at that time because they are very relaxed. They may not keep their airways open. So here, the, ch the child is actually awake. Um, using the back and neck muscles very well and that is something that is going to benefit him um, in terms of strengthening. Okay, so supervise the child uh, when he or she is doing tummy time. The reason is because they might get tired, they might get distressed, they might call for you and you know, they might want to end the tummy time. So that's when you know, we are around, we can actually pick the child up and quickly, you know, flip them back over before they become too distressed. You don't want them to be too distressed. And lastly, together, you know, I think children love to play with their parents, like what Parkson has mentioned. And when we do it together with them, we play with them, it actually makes it last longer. And they, they treat it as, you know, kind of a playtime. So that's when they'll be more keen for it. And what tummy time is going to look like for all our children will look different uh, as our child grows up. So on the left is when they're just starting out and on the right is when they're actually a bit stronger and they're more comfortable with it. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the ages. So actually tummy time can be started safely from birth. Um, that's a bit frightening some to some of us. Wow. Yes. <laughs> wow. I did not say know that this. Right now. <laughs> it was very frightening for me, you know. So I waited for a bit two months or so. But actually, uh, if you're confident, you know, I think it depends a lot on the, on the mummy and daddy's confidence level. We we always want to encourage, but it is never a must. So do only start when you feel confident and comfortable with it. And also baby is, you know, ready for it. So this is a baby who's a newborn. And we'll find that when the newborn is on the tummy, they will not be able to lift their head. And so we probably have to help them uh, position the head in a way that the cheek is resting on the surface. And the aim of that is actually to get them more comfortable with being in that position in the first place. Because that is not, not really a natural position for them. And just being in that position is actually sufficient. Okay? Um, some of, sometimes you might notice that the baby is quite uncomfortable and putting a lot of weight on the face. Uh, that is because they can't really lift up their head yet. And what you can do to help is to put a hand on the back of the buttock area to sort of you know, pre put some pressure on there to relieve the pressure on the face. And that makes it more comfortable as well. And then you can also... Put a little towel, you know, to uh, below the, the chest area to sort of support the chest. But uh, I would say just, you know, do it with caution because if we do that and then the baby can't really lift up the head, it, it still defeats the purpose. So baby must be able to lift up the head slightly for that to happen comfortably. 
Then there is another position that you can try, meaning that you are putting the baby on your chest, slightly inclined backwards. And in that way, the baby will not be fully flat down on the surface. And that's going to be much more comfortable for the baby to um, tolerate. And at the same time, no, the baby can look at you and then you can have some bonding time. So at birth to two months, can try about one to two minutes a day for a couple of times a day and stop if baby gets distressed or sleepy. And it's a good uh, time to do it when it's after a diaper change. Baby is quite alert, you know, not too close to feeding time. Otherwise, they'll like regurgitate all their milk uh, back at you. Huh? Sorry, Dr. Moira, I, I yes. interrupt. I like your mm. choice of this picture. It's the dad doing mm, the tummy Yeah, time. I was about to say that. <laughs> Parkson will like that. <laughs> and, and daddies, I think... Um, you can do that, but don't fall asleep. Huh? Oh. Okay, just need to, need to put it out there. <laughs> I know my husband fell asleep many times. <laughs> okay, so three to five months. This is when they are you know, stronger in their back and their neck and a little bit more comfortable, fun, you know, put the toy in front of them, try to stimulate them a little bit. You can even put yourself in front of them, okay? And then, then that serves as a playtime. And this is where you will notice they can actually put up their mm, hands and then they're resting on their forearms. Their head is going to be slightly upwards and they can even look around and observe their surroundings very well like that. Okay. Six to nine months, and this is when you've got to be a bit careful with their, you know, ambulating around and they're going to be exploring their surroundings. They are getting stronger and stronger and they might crawl forwards. Uh, so this is a good time to allow them to explore what is around. Of course, supervise and do it together. So I've just gotten some FAQs here because a lot of parents do ask me these questions along the course of my practice. Um, first question, baby is very fussy and cries, practically cries straight away lah, upon being put down on the tummy. What should they do? And the answer to that, I would say, it's actually very, very common. In fact, all my kids, you know, when we first started doing it, it was very... It was quite distressing for them because they, they would not feel very familiar with that. They love to be cuddled. And being put down on the firm surface is a little bit of a move away from the comfort zone. So don't worry. That's normal. And uh, do tr keep trying. I think when they first start you know, looking distressed, you can try to stimulate them and engage with them. Put a toy, put yourself, put your face there. Yeah, but... After a couple of seconds, if they continue to be distressed, then do uh, pick them up and give them a cuddle. Uh, try again later on. Okay. Ah, okay, so is there a minimum age? And I'd say no, there is not. Um, tummy time can be done safely from birth, like I alluded, alluded to. And the earlier the baby starts on it, the better, because the more used to it they are. And that position will not be so foreign to them. Okay. Can I place my baby to sleep on their tummies? And we would recommend to let them sleep on their backs instead and have them play when they're awake on their tummies. So are there any conditions uh, whereby my child should not do tummy time or should do it with caution? And I would say most, for most children, actually, it is safe, especially if they're full term, you know, no issues at birth, healthy, so no. But if baby is premature or has any airway issues or any facial issues, then best to check with uh, your pediatrician on when's the best time and how to start tummy time for them. So in closing... Tummy time helps the babies to grow stronger, develop well. Remember to do the fast. And here are some resources for you to read up more on. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moira. All right. Uh, at this point, I also like to uh, share with you that 
At PCF, educators work closely with parents to understand your child's progress during tummy time and provide guidance and support accordingly. At PCF, uh, educators also integrate activities that encourages infants to engage in tummy time, such as providing safe and comfortable spaces, fast, like Dr. Mora mentioned, and incorporating age-appropriate toys and sensory materials. Okay, uh, now that we have learned more about tummy time, <laughs> next is... Um, I feel that uh, something that I need a lot of practice and uh, knowledge and patience with myself for. Uh, and next up, we have Kelly from Juicy Parenting. Uh, you're going to be telling us how to cultivate patience in children. I believe that also requires a lot of patience in us. 100%, <laughs> yes. Okay, please enlighten me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So thanks everyone for being here. I want to say a special thank you to PCF for having me back again this year. It's really nice to see you all in person to connect because last year it was over Zoom. Um, and I guess thank you to all of you for coming, right? Like weekends are really precious for parents. So I'm a parent. I get it. Thank you for coming and being with us here today. So I'm going to start by asking you to imagine and remember the last time your kid was really impatient and really, really wanted something. So maybe they really wanted their snack right now. I see some nodding. <laughs> or maybe they really wanted to go to the playground right now. Or they wanted to leave this boring lecture right now. <laughs> right? So I think the common feature here is that when kids want something, they want it right now. Right? And it's really, really triggering for us. <laughs> And in these moments, a lot of times, there are people around us witnessing these wonderful moments where our kids want something right now, and inside we're just dying like, ugh, everyone thinks I'm a bad parent. So that is what I'm here to speak to you about today. I titled it Mai Gan Cheng. For those of you who don't speak Hokkien, it's basically, well, don't be impatient. <laughs> because if our children are going to have a fair shot at learning how to be patient, it really starts from us, like what Payton said. So before I go on, I'm going to tell you a bit about myself, because you might be thinking, who is this person and why is she talking about Mike Anjong? So my name is Kelly, and I actually didn't start out in the parenting space. I was a financial writer for 10 years, so I was a journalist at the Business Times, and then after that, I headed the investment communications team at DBS. And then I quit my corporate career entirely. When I had my first child, I decided I was not going back to work because I really enjoyed motherhood and I really wanted to spend time with her. So I quit my job. And I honestly never thought I was going back to work. But you know, there's a saying that man plans and God laughs. And I think it's really, really true in my case. So basically what happened is, as I shared earlier, I became a parent and I quickly realized I didn't know how to become a parent. I didn't know how to be a parent, a good parent. I knew how to do whatever was done to me, but I didn't really know how to be a better parent. And so it started me on this journey to really learn a lot of stuff. I did all kinds of courses on sleep, motor development, fine, fine motor development, brain science, feeding. I took five courses on feeding alone. That shows you the kind of like science nerd I am. Um, and I started sharing this stuff. So people would stop me at playgrounds or at playdates being like, hey, I heard you talk to your daughter this way. Can you share more about why you just said that? And I would be like, here, these are all the books I read. These are all the courses I did. Go do them. And people are like, I, I don't want to have to do all that. Can you just give me a course? Like, condense it. So that's how I ended up starting Juicy Parenting. Um, after my second kid, I ended up starting my own business. And what I do now is I teach an online course. I run an online community for parents who are trying to do something different from the norm. And when I say different from the norm, I mean I'm trying to move Asian parents away from a very punitive way of parenting that's very harsh. So when you think of punitive, you know, it's like yelling at your kids, caning them, isolating them, um, removing privileges when they don't behave the way you expect. And, you know, psychologists have shown over and over again that these things are not just damaging, they actually are ineffective. So what can we do instead? So that's what I do now in my job. I teach parents what they can do instead. And most importantly, in my background about me, I have two young kids. And this means I have plenty of patience every day with plenty of chances to deal with impatience every single day. So why is impatience so triggering? 
There are basically two reasons for this. The first one is resentment. For us, when we see our kids being impatient, the first thing it triggers in us is this sense of, you can't be impatient. I wasn't allowed to be impatient as a kid. If I were impatient, my parent would be like, well, no snack for you then, or the cane's coming out, right? And so when this happens, when we see our kids being impatient, the first thing is we're like, nope, no, no, not on my watch, right? There's no way you can be impatient because I wasn't allowed to be. There's a lot of resentment that comes up. The second reason is we feel a lot of fear. And the fear is often this feeling of like, oh, my child will never learn how to be patient. It's this feeling of like, oh man, am I raising a brat? Am I not doing a job well? So these are the two main reasons why impatience is so, so triggering for parents. And what this means is we tend to respond in two ways. The first way is to be really, really harsh and really punitive, where we basically start yelling at our kid and we start saying, hey, why are you so impatient? Why you cannot wait? And we say things like, uh, you ask one more time, huh? you ask one more time, you see what happens to your snack. I flush it down the door. Or they, we say things like, well, no snack for you. Or fine, no playground for the next week. Right? We start, the threats start coming out. We start getting really, really harsh and we raise our voice. Now, the second typical response that we as parents have is we go the other extreme. So parents who are really worried that a meltdown is coming, a tantrum is coming, tears are coming, we're like, I will do anything in my power to not have these tears happen, right? And so what we do is we start rushing. We get really kanchong ourselves. And we're like, okay, 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 okay. Snack is coming, snack is coming. I already told you it's coming. See, I'm opening the fridge, right? Our voice starts going up. Our actions start becoming faster. And we basically rush around like a headless chicken. We become kanchong spiders ourselves saying, okay, okay, okay. coming, 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 coming. Right? Now, neither of these two responses is ideal. And I'm going to talk you through the second one first. I'm going to tell you why rushing is not a good idea. So by rushing, we're essentially teaching our kid two things. First of all, we're teaching them that this is an emergency. We're telling them that, yes, okay, yeah, 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 this is an emergency. I better rush, I better rush, I better get this done. But in reality, this is not an emergency. If we look at the facts, no one is dying. No one is getting gravely injured. This is not an emergency. We don't have to channel that to our kids. The second thing that we teach our child by rushing is that we believe that they are incapable of waiting, right? We are telling them, okay, 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 I'm going to rush, I'm going to rush. And what we're saying is, I don't believe you can wait. But that's actually not true. Our kids are capable of waiting. We simply have to model that ourselves. So let's go to the other one. The other typical response is being harsh, right? Now, what's the issue? The issue with being harsh is that, you know, a lot of times as parents, when we raise our voice and when we tell our child, ah, you ask one more time, ah, see what happens to your snack. When we do that, our child goes silent and our child stops asking, right? And then we pat ourselves on the back and we're like, very good, I taught patience today. But actually, we did not teach patience. All we did was just silence our child into fear and made them decide, okay, fine, I'm not going to ask because, oh, she's getting mad or he's getting mad. And so we actually didn't teach any skills. If you think about what we're trying to do, we're trying to teach patients. We're trying to teach that this is not an emergency. We're trying to teach that, yes, you can wait, right? And by being harsh, we actually didn't do any of those things. We just silenced a child out of fear didn't actually impart any skills. So it's actually not very effective as a parenting strategy. So, I think the other thing I wanted to say is that when we become really harsh, we're essentially telling our kids, you are a nuisance and I am not listening to you until you speak to me properly. And if any of you are hearing that saying like, but Kelly, they are a nuisance. And I'm not listening to them until they speak to me properly. I see people nodding. If you are thinking that, you are falling into the common trap, this co very common mistake that all parents make, you are not alone, which is that we think that someone's behavior equals the person. Meaning, when our child's behavior is bad, we think that they are bad children. But that is actually not true at all. Not, it's so not true that I put a giant X over it so that you have this image in your mind. Just remember that a child's behavior 
does not mean that they are a bad person. Bad behavior does not equal bad person, right? So when a child's behavior is poor, it doesn't necessarily mean that the child is bad. It simply means that their behavior is bad. Yes, that's something we can correct. That's something we can change. But we have to believe that at heart, our children are always good, no matter what. Even when they're behaving poorly, that doesn't mean they as a person are bad. And when we think they're bad, that's when we start getting really punitive. That's when we start shouting and blaming and shaming and punishing them. But if we think about it as, okay, this is a skill they are trying to learn, their behavior isn't great, but they are learning, and I can support them in that, then we have a chance of doing better next time. So, I know this all sounds very good in theory, and you're just like, okay, fine, Kelly, so you don't want me to shout, what can I do instead? So I'm going to tell you what you can do instead. Three steps, very simple. The first step, hear them. I hear you want your snack now. Second step. State your plan. Tell them, once I'm done clearing the table, I can get the snack for you. And the third one is to validate their feelings, which is, I know it's hard to wait. Right? If we think about ourselves, we know it's five more minutes to lunchtime, this meeting is going on forever, it is hard to wait, you want to get out, you're impatient too. But you've learned the skills to wait. It's the same thing for our kids. So just three simple steps. Okay, I'm going to break it down for you. The script is basically, I hear you want, da 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 once I, da, 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 then you can do the whatever. And I know it's hard to wait. So if you think about this, right, you are really only changing the first and the second part. Everything else stays the same every single time. So let me give you another example. Let's say your kid wants to go to the playground, right? I hear you want to go to the playground now. Once I'm done with this load of laundry, we can go. I know it's hard to wait. So the parts in purple are the parts you change. Everything else is the same every single time. Now, a second script I want to share with you is, instead of X, you can do Y. This is a script that I always share with my clients. And people love it. It's super simple. So basically, you know your kid, right? Will be like, but mama, I want to go to the playground now. Right? So instead of that, you can literally tell your child, I hear you. So instead of saying, mama, I want to go to the playground now, you can say, hey, mama, I would like to go to the playground and you are modeling just by your words and by your tone. And do you notice that my face, when I say all these things, my body language, my tone, super calm. I'm not raising my voice. I'm not using swear words. No cane is coming out, right? I'm simply modeling. And I know it sounds too good to be true, but I promise you over time, this does work. It really, really does. And if we want our children to be patient, <laughs> to my Gan Cheong, then it has to start with us, right? So instead of X, you can say why. Now, I want to circle back to what I said in the beginning, which is a parent's deeper fear. So on the surface, we have this fear, right, that oh, our child is never going to learn. They're being such a brat. But actually, the deeper fear that we have within us that is often unsaid is that we fear we are being bad parents and that other people are judging us. And we fear that oh, if our child can't wait, that means I'm bad, I'm doing a bad job. And my invitation to you is to not focus on bad parent, bratty child, right? Instead of focusing on these two B words, I would encourage you to focus on a different B word, which is your child's brain, okay? And now the reason why it is so hard for them to wait and why they whine and why they scream is not because they're brats, it's not because they're bad kids. It's because the part of their brain that is responsible for emotional regulation, for impulse control, all of that only fully develops in their late 20s. Late 20s, people, right? Which means if you think about your toddler, three years old, four years old, even those of you who have teenagers, you're not even halfway through to late 20s, right? So we have to have some compassion and we have to have some understanding and age developmentally appropriate expectations of what they are capable of doing. And what I like to remind parents of is when you think of babies, right? You don't look at a baby and go, you should be able to wear your pants, wear your pants. Right? We know that there are physical limitations. Developmentally, they are learning something. But when it comes to cognitive limitations, because it's something we can't see, we often forget. But just remind yourself, when you are looking at your tiny child having a meltdown over their snack not coming or not being able to go to the playground, they're not a brat. Focus on the right B word. Remember, their brain is literally nowhere near fully developed in the way that we expect. 
So focus on the brain. Now, I also want to tell you that consistency is very key. Every time I give a talk like this, people will come up to me and be like, you know, Kelly, I tried what you said, but it didn't work. And I'm like, yeah, you just tried it once, my friend. <laughs> you got to try it many times. You're going to do it over and over again. And what I would remind you of is if you've been really harsh and punitive in the past, you are not just trying something new. You are also unwinding what you have done before. It's hard for you as a parent to try something new. It's also hard for your kid to get with the program with something new. So this stuff takes time. It doesn't happen immediately. But I promise you, you do it consistently over time, you will see change. You will see your child's bandwidth for patience start to increase. More importantly, you will start to enjoy parenting more. And how do I know this? Not just because I've done it with my kids. It's not just that. My kids are not special. I'm not special. I've done it with hundreds of clients over and over again. And they have seen changes in their kids too. So if I was special, we wouldn't be able to replicate those results, right? There's nothing special about me. All of you can do that too. All your kids can do that too. We just have to start believing it, believing in ourselves as parents, in our kids' ability to learn to be patient. So I'm going to be honest with you. We have just scratched the surface. There is a lot more I could say about this, right? Our child's brain development. Why are they so ganjong in the first place? Why do they immediately break down and cry and like throw a tantrum in the middle of fair price? Why does that even happen? Our children aside, there's a lot I could say as well about why we have our own meltdowns. Why is it we keep snapping to anger again and again, even though we tell ourselves, okay, next time, tomorrow, I'm going to be a better parent. I promise, I'm not going to yell. But it still happens. Why? Right? There's a lot to unpack there. So if you are interested to find out more, I have a one-hour free parenting training. And I, what I really like about this is I focus specifically on Asian parents. I think there's a lot of material out there, to be frank with you, that is created by Angamor people for Angamor people. But there's not a lot that's specific to an Asian context. And what the cultural context we have is very, very different. So there's a one hour completely free parent training. You can scan the QR code. I believe in the goodie bags, there's also my name card. It's on the back of my name card. Go do this free training. It doesn't cost you a cent. You just have to invest your time. I give you my top three parenting tips on how to stay calm and confident as a parent. I also tell you why some parents succeed at a more peaceful and respectful parenting approach and why some don't. And I also tell you the top mistake that parents make when they invest in their child's education and learning and development. What's the top mistake that they make? And so that once you know this, you won't have that blind spot. You won't need to make that very costly mistake. So that's my presentation. I really thank you all for listening and I look forward to Q&A. <laughs> thank you, Kelly. Please give a round of applause. As you were sharing, I thought of the book that I always go back to when I am lost, The Whole Brain Child. I think it helped me a lot. So if you want, you can also try that out as a resource. Buy it, put it. Uh, there is a Chinese version. I have both. So, <laughs> yeah, you can buy both and put it in your home as well. Okay. Uh, at PCF, educators model, educators model patients in their interactions with children, demonstrating the value of being patient and acknowledging children's patient behaviours. They also have activities that provide children with opportunities and strategies to manage conflicts and regulate their emotions. Okay, I am not sure if um, any of you are ready with any questions. Maybe... Uh, do I, should I ask one to start the ball rolling? I don't know. If anyone has questions. Oh, wow. Okay, we already have. Okay, let's uh, <laughs> pass the microphone. Uh, oh, actually, before we do that, maybe, okay, while they are setting up the microphone over here, let's have a photo together with the three guests. Uh, maybe I can get all three of you to stand for the front and then, uh, yeah, so that we can also rearrange the chairs later on. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Okay, so the chairs are ready and we'll all take a seat again. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. So if you have questions, you can come up here to ask them. Uh, would you like to? Good afternoon, everybody. 
It's just a, it's a, it's not a very difficult question. It's just that um, because the technology has came in, and we are tended to use more screen time, so less book. So now I'm saying that we are everything we come up with, they call e-tablets and things like that. How are we going to surround with books again? Because they are all screen. Okay. So this is a challenge. Okay. So so regarding like fathers or mothers reading yeah. to their children, so you right? Put, you definitely take a tablet and you either you read from tablets or, or Okay. Yeah. Okay. So actually I'm I'm curious as well. Is is reading from Kindle or a tablet considered screen time? I don't know. It's a grey area, right? I feel. But uh okay, so maybe if any of our experts have any uh <laughs> <laughs> responses to, to the question. But actually, I feel, for me, I, I've always preferred traditional books. And one way, one very easy way to surround your kids with books is to go to the library. We have fantastic libraries in Singapore, okay? They are really beautiful. And if nothing happens, they end up playing there. So, <laughs> yeah. Maybe uh, our experts can share more? Well, I, I want to just share a, a research that was done, a study that was done. Um, so, this research has brought together a few kids, right? Uh, uh, all under the age of five. So they broke, up, broke them up into three groups. One of the groups, you know, they were um, being read to. Another group that was uh, watching some um, e-books or something like that, okay? And then another one just watching a video clip, you know, a video being played over and over again. At the same time, while the kids were doing all this, their brains were being scanned, all right, to look for brain activity. Okay, so if the brain is being engaged, that means the child is following or thinking or doing something, processing the information that he's gathering, there will be some brain activity. So of these three groups, there's only one group of children that showed some brain activity and it was the group that was being read to. Okay, and there was interaction by, between the adult and the child. For the other two groups of children, there was hardly, there was some, but very, very little brain activity. So what it shows is, you know, when a young child up to five years old is looking into a screen, whether reading an e-book, that means the, the, it's being read to them actually, all right, with all the animation and um, the pops and whistles and all that, all right, there are too many distractions going on and the child's brain is simply overwhelmed. All right, and when you're overwhelmed, what do you do? You just switch off. <laughs> and so that's what, that's what most children do. Their brains just switch off. They're staring to the screen, but nothing is happening up here. Okay, so yeah, so that, that uh, I think is very informative and tells us what happens inside here. Yeah, thanks, Parkson. So um, pertaining to screen time in children, we, especially in the early childhood uh, period, we actually discourage it. Um, the reason is because when we are talking about child development, child development happens when there is what we call a serve and return. Okay, so serve and return means that when the child does something, there is a return or a reaction from the caregiver. And that interaction itself is going to contribute to the child learning and development in the brain. And, and like what Parkson has mentioned, when there's a screen playing, you know, whatever program it is, there is the lack of that serve and return interaction. And hence, the child does not really learn much. So certainly, the child is going to learn the song. She's, she might not learn the alphabet, but um, the kind of learning that happens is not going to be um, very high in quality. It might just be memorizing, it might just be, you know, hearing a repetition. But when the, the, there is a serve and return interaction between a caregiver, that's when the quality of the learning becomes very, very high. And the child is then able to take that learning and apply it to other situations. And that's going to be outside the screen. So when Payfen mentioned like Kindle or that, uh, is that considered a screen? I would say yes, for the purposes of early childhood. Um, and when uh, Parkson's talking about reading, it is ma mainly pertaining to interactive reading. So that is going to give you that serve and return interaction. Okay, thank you. Thank you to Dr. Moira and Parkson. And thank you for the question. Oh, we have time for one more question, if there is uh, any more. Uh, if 
<laughs> because we already have, uh, we had a lot of information from our three guests. So, okay, I believe uh, many of you here are busy parents with cranky kids because it's already 4 p.m. <laughs> okay, once again, please give a round of applause uh, to our three guests for their wonderful sharing today. And uh, I would like to also remind all of you to scan the QR code and uh, give us your feedback before you leave. Oh, this is the feedback form. We will leave it here for a while so that you have time to scan and uh, leave your feedback. And also, I would like to remind you of the PCF Sparkle Tots Open House. I believe some of you might be considering uh, PCF Sparkle Tots. 24th June, uh, you can visit openhouse.pcf.org.sg or scan the QR codes on the banners around to find out more. And today we actually have one more uh, workshop later on, a panel discussion exploring literacy. So if you're very concerned about your child's literacy, you can come back here to Space One at 5.30pm. And our friendly ushers in the red shirts can actually give you more information. We have uh, parent-child activities going on as well. If you have friends whose kids are below the age of six, do come on down to our Tampanese Hub. This will be going on till 6.30pm today. And tomorrow, I'll be at One Pongol. And tomorrow's program will be from 10am to 5.15pm. And last but definitely not least, on your way out, do remember to redeem your goodie bags. Thank you so much once again. And thank you to Parkson, Dr. Moira and Kelly. Happy parenting, everyone. <laughs>